live with John Three. Welcome to be on the show, man. Thanks, Joe. Thanks very much. Uh, good, good. How, how's things been for you guys during lockdown? Let's start with oh, the normal. Lockdown. lockdown was obviously a bit of an interruption. Um, for about six weeks, we were closed. Um, and then thereafter, we slowly started to go to work two, three days a week. And then thereafter, obviously, back full speed. Um, but we, we are fortunate. We've had more than enough work to keep us busy. And in fact, we have enough work probably till end of the year, maybe beginning next year. So now we're doing well. That's, that's not bad. Look, uh, that's, I mean, you're not, you're not a, a public facing company, if you want to put it that way. I mean, you guys, you guys can hide in the shop for, for most of it. So the should make we things a bit better. Correct. We don't have passing trade, um, so we have we have inquiries via um, the internet. Obviously, we've got one or two dealers, and at the moment we're busy with quite a big contract for the USA, which is an ongoing contract. Um, so we, we, to be quite honest, before, guys, before we are, start, sorry, sorry, John, before we start on that, just for, for a lot of people that, that don't know you well, um, let me let me just do an introduction. So. You have a serious career, and from a South African perspective uh, in the car industry, you are the man behind the CAV, the GT40s, if I'm not mistaken. Yes, then, that's correct. Um, and then more recently, you are the guy behind the Stealth Beetle, the Vito, the the V8 Beetle. I mean, the, that that's some seriously big projects that that you've undertaken. So, let's start off by. Let's start from the beginning of, of where, where did your engineering, where did everything come from? Well, I've kind of gone full circle with the whole V8 Stealth Beetle. Um, when I was studying my engineering, um, I had no money and I, I was repairing Beetles from home. And, um, you know, the, the people always say you either hate a Beetle or you love a Beetle. And... I'm one of the guys that unfortunately decided to love a beetle. Um, so while I was studying, I was fixing the odd beetle. Um, and in fact, my mother had a beetle which the engine broke and I rebuilt the engine. And I immediately liked them. Um, for instance, I hate I hate the Mini. And there, there are those who are going to say they love Minis. Okay, so anyway. So I started to work on beetles. Um, and by the time I finished my diploma, I had enough work at home to not continue in an engineering field. My lecturers, wow. et cetera, said, you must go in that direction. I said, no, I'm going to start my own business, which is what I did. So to this day, I've never been employed. Um, I started my own business then, and I started with Beatles. And two, three years later, obviously, you can only do so much with a Beatle. I started to think of, how can I make this thing go faster? What can I do for handling? And that, that progressed to building Cobras, Porsche Speedsters, blah, blah, blah. And there was a point, obviously, where it all progressed to GD40s. Um, and yes, correct, full circle. A few years ago, I thought, I still love Beatles, but I want to do something completely crazy with them. I just, I, it can't just be, uh, you know, whatever, everybody takes the back of the car and they put a Subaru engine in or blah, blah, blah. I wanted to mid-mount it. Obviously, I love for GD40s. Um, and, and the idea was with the Beetle was actually just to build one for me. Just something that on a Sunday morning, go for a nice breakfast run, just enjoy it. But then um, my uh, distributor at the time, who used to sell my GD40s into Germany, he was here on holiday and he saw what I was doing. And he said, come on, John, you can't just build one. And that's how it started. We're now busy with chassis number 11. Um, we're sending them all over the world. And, yeah, so, you know, it's like a crazy idea that's turned into, into something that earns me an income. That, I mean, I, I do remember a while back I, I was at your shop. And the engineering that you guys did on those Beetle, beetle chassis, were, it's mind-blowing. Complete. I mean, that, that was one of the best engineering work I've ever seen in my life. I mean, you, you guys are 
It's like an airplane. <laughs> <You know? laughs> everything, everything is so precise, and every line, every, you know, um, it's absolutely phenomenal. Just, just the the infrastructure and how you guys did it. Um, I, and I, I remember after after being there, every time, uh, excuse me, it came up about you guys and the Beatles. I, I would just always go on about the engineering side of it because you guys just got it spot on. Um, Thanks, John. That's very on. nice to hear. It's very nice to hear. We know when I get to work, I only see the problems. I don't see the good stuff. Um, I just see what am I going to deal with today. So thanks very much to say, for saying that. Um, I also, obviously, I moved the goalpost a little bit. Um, most, let's, let's call them kit cars. Um, although I had this argument with somebody recently, even a BMW that comes out of a factory is actually also just a kit car. It's a bunch of components that's been put together. So anyway, but most kit cars are built with mild steel tubing, space frame. We all know that. Mm. And... I just wanted to do something different, and hence I started to investigate the whole aluminium chassis scenario. So I had to do a lot of homework because obviously the aluminium, or as the Americans call it, aluminium, it's not just straightforward aluminium. You not, must use a particular grade. It must be designed to do what it's about to do. And I started to play with building a, a box chassis. It's not a true monocoque chassis because then the body would be incorporated into the chassis as well. So it's more a box chassis. Um, thoroughly enjoyed designing it. And then if you're going to build such an awesome chassis, you're going to have to think, let's make the suspension special. Let's make the brake special. Let's make the brake line special. And that's what I think you're talking about. Mm. The whole package is has been engineered, not just built. I, know, I think that the, the biggest Tells tie. I mean, I'll I'll show photos um, of it. The telltale signs is the car from the rear. When you see those enormous rear fenders and those big those those big ass tires, but I, mean, I was just I was fin completely taken away with how you guys actually fit everything in. I mean, there's no it's a beetle. There's no space for anything. Yeah. You know? Um, the the steering the how your steer your steering setup worked and and all this type of stuff. So you still okay you you're losing the back seat and stuff, but you're still regaining a lot a, a, a lot of the original stuff from from the driver's perspective and that feel. It's just the handling is just a hundred times better, and obviously braking everything is a hundred times better. Now when I saw you the last time, you guys were still running the Audi motor. Um, That's true. Uh, yeah, the twin turbo Audi, and you guys were playing around. I mean, I think we had the discussion. I, I, I started pointing you in direction because you guys were looking at the LS3, the Chevy motor. Where did you guys go from there? So there was a time, so correct, um, all the vehicles at the moment were using the, the Audi Audi 4.2 V8 with, with turbos or not turbos, to be quite honest. The turbos it's a bit over the top. I mean, you, it, the thing is like a switch. We get 370 kilowatt out of it on something that weighs less than a ton. The turbos, it's it's for, for the lunatics. But yeah. it did give us a foot in the door because we're doing something completely different. And if you just do something different, people follow you. But to answer your question regarding the LS3, um, there was a point when we just scrapped the idea of the LS3, mostly because we wanted to stay with the feel of Volkswagen, Audi, that yeah. whole entity. But we've had such an immense amount of inquiries from the USA and remarkably also from Europe, where guys have all asked, would you do the LS3? And I, I know where they're coming from because as you know, Joe, it's an absolute bulletproof engine. Yeah. I mean, mm. you can put it in any machine and it will go. You can put it in your wheelbarrow. You can put it in a, <laughs> in a rocket to the, to the sky. That LS3 is just unbreakable. So we have... They're light. Uh, yes. If I'm not mistaken, sorry, they, they're light. Can we just explain to you why, why people believe the LS3? Because from my understanding is it's not big. From a V8 no, perspective, even though it's, it's quite a small block. It's, it's almost smaller than the Audi motor, believe it or not. So, mm. so in width, it's smaller, 
because as you know, LS3 is still sitting with the cam down the center. It hasn't got cams in the head. It's still old school, push rods, where with the Audi, you're sitting with cam and depending which one, you've got four cams. Some of them, five valves per piston, blah, 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 blah. All kinds of crap, sorry to use the word, but I call it crap, that wants to read sensors. The LS3 is just saying, eight pistons, a bunch of valves, big boys, um, a chain, some push rods, and it works like a dream. Um, it's light. It's slightly higher in complete size from bottom of some to very top of the intake. It's a bit higher than the Audi. It's obviously a bit longer because you're talking 6.2 liters, not 4.2, but on width is actually smaller. Um, and we've looked at, can we get it into that beautiful alley chassis? Yes. Our, our biggest complication is that at the front of the engine, you've got your water pump and pulleys and stuff. Now, that's going to interfere a little bit with our center tunnel. So we have to redesign that. And we have to take those water pipes and we're going to run them next to the car, as in next to the body, but under the running boards. And we're going to take it all the way back to the, to the radiators. And the center tunnel we can then use for other things. So it is solvable. We've already purchased the second-hand LS3 motor to do, to do the development. And I think in six months' time, when you see me with a big smile on my face, um, <laughs> you'll be driving it with an LS3 motor, absolutely. Because I, I remember you you said to me the, the day the, the Audi with the twin with the twin turbo, you said the power was too sporadic. It was just all yes. over. Uh, just as you're coming out corner, you put your foot down. It was just when once the turbo kicks in, it was just all over the place. Yeah, you know, you, you want if, if if you want to drive over a car, you want a linear curve. Mm -hmm. You want something that, as far yeah. as your foot goes, the power goes. With the, yeah. with, the, with the moment with the turbos, foot goes down, and then suddenly you move your foot a little bit further, and suddenly all hell breaks loose. And yeah. it's not enjoyable for the guy behind the steering wheel. If you're a bit of a nut, it's enjoyable, but how many times? Then you grow tired of it. You can't spend your life grabbing the, the ox. So, yeah, exactly. And then you've got a bit of a wet road or some slicks, a bit of an oil slick somewhere, yeah. and the next thing you, you're hitting sideways, you know? I mean, the guys in the workshop, the guys working with me know that if I want to take the beetle out, one of them will go over and unclip the two wastegates. Because I actually have more fun with the wastegates just flapping in the wind. Let them open. Don't give me three-quarter bar boost because Jean's going to come back upset because he says it's undrivable. <laughs> so the car standing there, the demo car standing with both wastegates loose, we still get 0.3 of a bar. We still have plenty power, but it's not crazy power. It's much mm. more enjoyable. Uh, anyway, okay. I think that – sorry to, to, to interrupt. The, the LS3 – is a much more usable engine. Smooth power, indestructible, lots of torque. I mean, crazy torque. I think yeah. it's at almost 600 newton meter torque or something stupid. Um, so yes, we will be doing it um, in the Beatles for sure. Now look, the the the, the LS3. The bottom line, there's a reason why everyone in the US is doing LS swaps, um, especially from all 350s and stuff to 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 the especially to the LS3s. Uh, I mean, we, we've started to, they, they're appearing in hot rods all over the country as yeah. well. Guys are opting opting for, for LS3s as well. Um, and like you said, they're, they're absolutely bulletproof. It's like the um, the Ford Coyotes. Yeah. Those motors are also completely indestructible. Um, I, I remember dealing with the, um, the guys from Roush, and someone once told me that the bottom end – of a coyote can actually handle almost a thousand horsepower sure. without changing anything. Yes, yes. Um, when when we worked I, when we worked with Rush on the, uh, the the drift car, um, I remember the guys went and said, "Listen, what what happens if we break the coyote?" And Rush's response was, "Then you send it to us so we can see how you did it." Yeah, Let us know. So, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Um, they, they, they want. They want to. If it breaks, they want to know how it broke, so they can yeah. make sure it doesn't break ever again. Yes, yes. Now, 
now you've got a new project out that you've been you're saying that from the US and you, you when we when we set up this thing you, you said you were not sure if you could talk about it yet so I take it I, hopefully you can I, I can I can, I can definitely hint about it unfortunately I can't tell you exactly what it is but um, with the industry that I'm in and being the USA I think it's quite quite obvious it also involves wheels it also involves fuel um, and we are using the same technology that we've learned in the Beetle chassis. So it's also aluminium chassis. Again, um, to give you an idea, the finished product weighs about 360 kilograms. So if that's not a dead giveaway in the direction of where I'm going, so the complete vehicle, including drivetrain, um, engine, etc., is only 360 kilograms. Um, it's only got about 150 horses, but it's um, it's a little rocket ship, and that's all I can say at the moment, unfortunately. Um, Let's see, 150 not, horses. I mean, that, that's a that's a basic Renault or something, but you've got a third of the body weight that's attached exactly. to that. That's exactly. crazy. Um, it's it's incredible fun to drive. We've got one in the workshop, so when you're in Cape Town, you'll have to go and take it for a run. Oh, um, Unfortunately, I, I've been asked by the Americans not to say too much, which is fair enough. It is their product. Once we've designed it, it's their product, and they need to decide when they want to launch it. Yeah. Well, um, I'll, I'll tell you what. When, when they're ready, you give me a call, and we'll bring you back up, back on the show, absolutely. and then we'll, 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 we'll go, every, go through everything. Absolutely. Now, I know this, this was your baby, but what, what you've done with the – BM, you did with the GT40 years ago yeah. as well, didn't you? Yeah. You, you redesigned the bottom structure, everything of the GT40. Um, how, how did that process came to be? Because, I, I guess this is, this is ages ago. I was, I was at, I think, at your shop when you guys just finished developing. You got the first batch out. I think it was uh, about 2002 or something. We were both a lot younger. Yeah, yeah. That, then that's when you guys re- and then you started. You, you started the because that was a big project that you guys took on. I mean, that sorry, that, that, that was a that was a big project. I mean, because to work with the, the GT40, I mean, the design stuff behind that that car was phenomenal when it came out originally. But obviously, yes. we were all looking at it from a kit uh, from a kit car perspective. Yes. What. You made some big changes on that. What what was the biggest changes that you made on it? Well, um, one of the things that I can tell you is the car or the chassis had 65 panels um, used to put it together. And we changed 64 of the 65 panels. <laughs> um, so, yes, it was quite a big change. Um, the main part, the main reason for that, because the original chassis that I inherited, the torsional stiffness was very, very low. Um, mm. so much so that if you had to jack the one side up, the door wouldn't quite close anymore. So we, once we redesigned the chassis, we were at up at 32 Newton meter per degree, which is very high. It's higher than a production car, a bit lower than a Formula One car, obviously. But we changed the torsional stiffness. And then once you do that, everything else follows. We changed the suspension. Um, components, as in the uprights, we changed the geometry a little bit, not much. We introduced adjustable bump steer. Um, we changed um, steering um, ratios. And then the biggest thing was up the brakes. The brakes were horrendous. Um, mm. The brakes were fine on the road, but we had upped it so much that the guys who started tracking the cars and were racing in sports and GT kept the brakes as is. The road version. <laughs> it was good enough for sports and GT and doing some good time. So, unfortunately, I think sometimes to my detriment, I over design things. I, I get very carried away. I only want it a certain way. And we we must have sold, we sold more than 100 GT40s in the time that I owned the company. And I think we got paid too little for what I designed. Because I really had designed a super duper yeah. car, which I was very proud of. 
as you might might know, Sterling Moss even drove it in 2006 at Le Mans. Yes. It was a race car. And even he raved about it. Um, and, and, you know, as you know, he passed away recently. I still have a photo of him and me standing next to one. And I think now with his passing, I should really make the effort and mount it and put and it up definitely. in the office. But it was a very special time to have met him, especially next to an iconic car like the GD40. Yeah. And one thing I remember about him, if I may quickly mention it, um, no, we were at for, for three days. And the first day I met him, obviously, and, and I introduced him to the car and we were sitting inside the car. And he said, so tell me about these switches. And I said, um, this is fuel, this is radiator fan, and I was, you know, showing him what it is. And the next day we would sit in the car and say, just tell me about these switches again. And we would start all over <laughs> again because he was 70 plus years old. Yeah. And I think he just enjoyed sitting there in the car and just having fun. And I, me- I remember, the other thing I remember is that the um, French marshals uh, at the Mar, it's probably not the right word to use, but wouldn't allow him onto the track because he didn't have a helmet on. Because, as you know, they used to race with those, I don't yes. know what you call them, a little... Well, uh, Afrikaans is called piss pot. Piss pot, <laughs> yeah. And I don't know what you would call it in English. It's, it's no way of describing it, but it was just a little um, indication of a helmet. It wasn't a true helmet. And he said, guys, that's fine. If you don't want me to, to go on the track, I won't go on the track. And they couldn't stop the event. So they said, oh, well, please, you must go. And there he went with his overall that he had raced in for 50 years. You know, so, yeah. Anyway. Okay. Um, how, how can they say no to Stilling Moss? I mean, that's... Exactly. <laughs> they had to stop this multi-billion rand event and 200,000 people watching because he doesn't have the right helmet on. Not going to happen. And he knew that. So they said, no, please go. And off he went. Yeah. I mean, that, that, that car of yours probably had more security features just in the seat than the complete race car they had yeah, on the what day. What used to race with, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Um, absolutely insane. But th- that we, must have... We, sorry, Joe, and the interesting thing is we put that car up for sale when we got to Le Mans, and a lot of people were interested until Sterling Moss put his signature on one of the soles, and it sold yeah. instantly. Obviously. Because he had signed it, yeah. Obviously, I mean yeah. that's just that's absolutely insane. I mean, who, quite... who wouldn't want anything done by him? I mean, yeah, quite a collectible item. Yeah. Oh yeah. But that car must have. I mean, that experience must have taken you guys all over the world. I mean, is it? Was did it amaze you as a South African getting to that level? I mean, you you you. South African company develops a, a car that is a pace car based on a Le Mans car that, that becomes a pace car at, at Le Mans. I mean, that's, that's a huge accomplishment. Joe, um, I, I live very much in my head. I'm a designer. I'm a mad engineer. And as I said earlier, when I arrive at work, I see all the things that I must do today, what I must fix, what I must repair, the fires I must put up. But every now and then, I realize that us, if I may say this, in a shitty little company on the tip of Africa, built something which ended up in France, at Le Mans, with Sterling Moss behind the steering wheel. And yes, that's when it brings brings you back down and say, well, actually, what you've done is not so bad, you know? Um, It was a special time standing there at the track and seeing our car go out. We, of course, have tons of footage of it. Um, <laughs> but it was a special moment. Yes, absolutely. It was a very special moment. Now, from from, from my engineer perspective, and, and I, I'm trying to get my head around your head, if I want to put it that way. You Do you get into, when you get into especially all the classics and that type of stuff and you start driving around, does your head immediately start spinning on how you can improve what you could do. Um, or maybe I should put it, is there more cars that you want to get your hands on that you would love to take a stab at and redesign? 
Do you want to maybe rather ask me what's my favorite car? Yeah, <laughs> let's go that way. I love Porsche Speedsters, the old oh. 356. Just love oh, them. Me too. And, Don't you, you know, still have a body in the shop? Last time I was there, you had a body. Yeah, there. but that was the Cabriolet. I'm talking yeah. about the coupe, the proper coupe. Um, you know, obviously, because of the game I'm in, I get asked often, but what do you drive? Believe it or not, I drive a Bucky. Um, and what would you buy if you had the money? Today's cars don't turn me on at all. Uh, there's, there's nothing there that really excites me. I think the old 60s cars, the 356, as I said, they were just so beautiful. Today's cars are not beautiful. They, they might be wow, but they only wow for two or three years, maybe five years if you're lucky. But nobody sits at a car since looking at a car like a, like a Porsche, which is 60 years old, no, maybe even more, 60 years old, and look at it still to today. You, you can put your chair down in a workshop, look at it, and it's just stunning. Um, mm. So in that, in that respect, maybe there's a bit of old school there. The cars before that doesn't really excite me, to be quite honest. Um, and if I could... I would like to take a 356 um, and, yeah, I don't know, I would, but then again, it would probably just be for me. I would make a car for me. Um, well, you can't you can't do that because if you if you build a 356, then I'm going to want one. See, uh, <laughs> just, just before lockdown, it's actually, I think I've got the magazine somewhere here. Uh, yeah. We had a, a 356 that we featured. It was an outlaw one sitting at Creative Rides in, in Joburg. Yes. Yes. And I, I did the photo shoot on that one. I took that, that thing out. And I fell in love with it. Yeah. I absolutely fell in love with it to, to yeah. the point where during lockdown and stuff, I've been obsessed trying to find other fiberglass shell. I mean, I, I think I, I've joined about 12 groups on Facebook. Yes. Um, all dealing with Porsche 356s and replicas and that type of stuff. Yeah. I'm obsessed, but I, I, but I, I don't. I'm at the point where I don't care if it's if it's a cabriolet or, or anything anymore. Yes. I just I want one. Just that yeah. shape. Yeah, it's, yeah. It's, it's beautiful. And then I saw um, who was it? Um, Ryan, the guys from um, West Coast Customs. They did one two years ago uh, that they stuck on a Porsche Boxster. I think it was. Yes. Yes. But it was a steel body, um, and what they did is they actually they widened the 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 Porsche a little bit. Yeah. Um, but it came out beautiful. I mean, they yes. didn't they didn't screw the line, screw up the lines because that's normally what the guys do. It actually came out very very nice. And I'm like that. And it has that iconic shape, everything with it, you know. Yeah. I mean, if you if you left me alone for a year and I didn't have anything else to dist distract me you know as in the workshop i would just i would have the best year of my life just to build my own little three five six to perfection again obviously yeah my my the other side of me unfortunately i studied fine art before i studied engineering so i have an extreme fanatical eye for detail uh, it is for me the most important thing yeah um with the with the beatles for instance um, to tell you again, just a short little story. As you know, always, when you put an electrical loom down, it's all about how do you attach this loom to the chassis. Mm -hmm. And um, Pierre, who is my electrical boffin, he went hunting for the, the absolute right fitting, <laughs> which we tap into the chassis, the M3 thread, and then it's got a little plastic holder with a countersunk M3 stainless steel mm -hmm. screw, screw head with a little cap that comes around and we were so excited about this and it's it's this big <laughs> and nobody <laughs> knows about it which shows you how twisted we are mm -hmm. um but yeah so when i look at a 356 i look at all the beautiful things the way the light sits the little screw that holds it the pinstripe down the side those are all beautiful items you know it's mm. it's the feature that makes it a sculpture on four wheels, which happens to be able to go down the road. Um, and I studied ceramic sculpture, so I'm, I'm integrating 
my love for art and my engineering ability to, to create something special. And if I have the opportunity and I'm blessed to, to have that, to design what I want to design and what turns me on, I mean, shit, what more can a man ask for? You know, very, exactly. very fortunate. Exactly. But but you, you'd love the manufacturing part. I mean, on, on the GT40, I, I, I remember you told me there was almost nothing it was only a few parts that were actually imported. The rest, everything you tried to manufacture locally, didn't you? Correct. The only things we brought in is what we couldn't manufacture or wouldn't manufacture, like the gauges. We're obviously not going to make gauges. The shock absorbers we brought in, um, calipers, obviously, but everything else we made, absolutely everything, you know, gear shift, levers, everything. We, what we could produce ourselves, we did. We obviously didn't make the engine. We didn't make the gear. Um, but we, we had quite a list of stuff, and I remember our stores, we had tons of stuff in the stores because when you sell a car and a guy says, I want another wishbone or something, you can't say to him, sorry, I can't remember, I made that one. So we, we yeah. have to have tons of the stuff, and we had agreements with our distributors. We were actually at a point um, when we were doing the GD40s, there was a point where we were shipping a car every eight working days. Um, which is nothing like high tech or these boys, but to us, with only a team That's, of 22 cars, mm. it was quite an achievement. We were we were pushing, and I think that time in my life, towards the end of the project, I realized that I just become another businessman sitting behind a laptop. I wasn't, I didn't have the enthusiasm you saw 10 minutes ago mm. of touching, yeah. and feeling, and making, and. I sold it and went much smaller, which is what we're doing now. And the Beetle was the obvious first choice to do something exciting, which is what we did. Um, and now with the American project, yeah, I'm back to what I really enjoy, which is building and designing and feeling what I'm building, you know. And as I said to you er earlier, when this American uh, vehicle, I almost said the name. <laughs> Where <do I> you? <laughs> you must take it for a run because I know what's going to come, what's going to happen. You're going to come back and say, Jean, I want one of these. And that's the <laughs> nice stuff that, that we, you know, we as South Africans, I, I don't know if it's, if it's in our genes, but we like to just make what we perceive, what we design in our heads, we will build. Um, and, you know, now, there's something I want to mention about that. I'll come back to that. We, we've always, in Afrikaans, we have the saying, a boer maak a plan, which yeah. means us as boers, we will always make a plan to do something. And when, when I was approached with this vehicle for the USA, by the way, they knew me from the GD40 game. They didn't just happen yeah. to find me. Um, they said, can you do us? And, they hadn't even finished a sentence. I said, yes, because I know I can. we can. Yeah. We, as South Africans, we can. And then when you drive down the road with this thing that you've just designed and it's doing everything you want, it's an incredible feeling. That's what we work for. We don't work for, for the fact that it's a business and it makes money and blah, blah, blah. That's irrelevant. It's that joy of driving something that you've designed. And you hear the sound. You can feel it in the back of your, you know, on your arse, yeah. you can feel it, and the wind blows through your hair, except if you've got no hair to, like me. <laughs> but, but you do come back, and and I immediately enjoyed it. And when I handed the vehicle over to one of my guys, he came back with a big smile on his face. And then the other guy drove it, and he came back with a smile. Then my landlord drove it, and he came back with a smile. And I thought, there must be something right about this. Everybody's exactly. smiling, you know? So, yeah, I don't know where we started with all this, but... Yeah, I mean, I, I've got to get you into one of these vehicles. You're going to love it. I, Absolutely. I'm going to be in Cape Town. I'm coming to shoot um, Rod Shop in okay. October. Um, okay. Yeah, I'm busy firing up finally. I'm firing up the TV show. Um, yeah. On Friday morning, I fly to Joburg because uh, yeah. I've just signed um, my car sponsor for the show is Rush, actually. Oh, so, brilliant. Uh, brilliant. Yeah, performance center. So I'm... I'm picking up a Rush Ranger um, to Excellent. use for while we're doing it, and I'm test driving that. So Excellent. October, I'll be there, and I'll definitely call you. I know I gotta go. I know what it is. 
everyone knows. <laughs> I do. Know. I've seen videos, so I, I know. Okay. So I'm excited. And okay. yeah, I definitely, I'm going to be there. Um, I think that's going to be a good project. But I, I love what you what you said from perspective. Do you, do you think that's why so many U.S. companies or – I mean, there's some great South Africans in motor racing. Yeah. But – more behind the scenes actually than in behind the steering wheel. Um, yeah, well, you know, if I may answer you this way, um, from personal experience, when I went to the USA because I was asked to then fly over to go and look at this project to see if I'm interested in building. And we, you know, we sat and we talked and, and they had like a sample of what they wanted and blah, blah, blah. And, there was a point when I asked him, but guys, I don't understand. Why don't you just build it here? This is America. This is the country where anything happens. This is the country where people are crazy about wheels and cars. I don't understand why you've called me. Yeah. And the interesting thing was, and I'll try and relay what they explained to me. They said, if you want the package, which is what they want from me, they want the whole lot, electrics, steering, body, blah, blah. Yeah. You won't find a company there to do it. You'll find a company that does chassis. You'll yeah. find a company that does suspensions. you find a guy that does gearboxes. But each one, they only focus on their field. They don't, you don't go to them and say, I want all of this and phone me when it's designed. Mm. Where we as South Africans, I don't know, I mean, I hope I'm not generalizing, but we will, we will find a way. I will find a way of designing the chassis. I will find somebody to help me to do the electrics. I will find a guy who does the body. I'll find some guy in a garage who knows something about spoking the wheels. The wheels mm. are spoke wheels. We have it all available here. And and every person you meet here can't just do one thing. He can do a couple of things. There we and, go. That's I, I call them all-rounders. That, that's something I, I have found... Um, as well, like I said, dealing with with South African car builders, some South African car builders, and and the U.S., you, you get the guys in the U.S. a fabulous fa- fabrication, you know. Yeah. They they, and if if I if I can use a, a shop that keep people understand, it's it's like Gas Monkey, okay. Gas Monkey is from a shop perspective is phenomenal. The guys they have there are absolutely phenomenal in their job. But they all specialize in different in different aspects of, yeah. of doing things. Every TV show you you watch, you see that that there's always multiple multiple guys, and they all have their certain. This guy's build, this guy's motor builders, this guy's chassis builder. This is the big welder. This yeah. is the fabricator. This is the painter. Yeah. South Africa, and I've actually met quite a few of them, where it's a complete mad scientist. It's a complete person that you wake up in the morning and you go, oh, man, I had this dream that I want to put a V12 into a scooter, okay? <laughs> yeah. but it needs to have flame flow. And he goes, okay, cool. The best V12 to use is this one. Okay, <laughs> This is the sco- yeah. scooter we're building. Yeah. And then wow. within 10 minutes, he draws up the chassis plan, all this type of stuff. He mixes, he welds it, he paints it, he does it, he does the electric, he, fi- he figures the whole thing out. Actually, my, my good friend, Andre, Andre Stradom, uh, he works with, with Jimmy Price. He, he's one of those mad scientists. Yeah. Um, and I've, I've met a few of them where you can pull any car into his yard and you know that it's broken. And he's within 10, you give him a day, he'll give you the history, where it came from, who developed it, how it was developed. He yeah. knows, and it's cars, planes, Alice. You know, they, they've yeah. just got such a, a wide aspect. Yeah. And the weirdest thing, they don't have degrees and stuff behind them. It's just yeah. knowledge, you know. Yes, yes. It's work. Accumulated um, knowledge, yeah. Accumulated, yeah. yeah. Um, uh, Pete, uh, Pete Westcott, he works um, with uh, Oris Auto in, in Joburg. I know Pete's going to listen to this. He's going to love this. Um, he's been one of the top race car builders through South African history. I mean, I, I, we interviewed him last in last season of Rod Shop. Um, 
and I, I couldn't actually keep his resume. The, his resume was too long for yes, the show. Yes. Yeah, 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 exactly. Yeah, and he's done everything. You were, yeah. sit and you're staring at them. Um, but like I said, and I, 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 found, I heard this a lot, they said, in the racing fraternity. That's why a lot of racing teams have South Africans. Hmm. Is because he's just, they just go to guys, you know. They then. Well, the thing is, they, if you're, if, sorry, if you're focused on on one item and you don't understand how it affects the other items, that's a major disadvantage, you know. And and I think, let's say I'm me or any other designer or mad scientist, as you call us, if we don't see the bigger picture, then then the project as a whole fails. You've got to be able to, and, and, and you can't make decisions about the other items if you don't understand it. If, if you want to do a chassis, you must understand suspension. You must understand shock absorbers. You must understand the body. You must understand the steering. So we all have, we have this wider spectrum of understanding. Hopefully it's not, what is that saying? Um, uh, master of none, what? Um, yes, this, yes, yes, yes. Um, how does it go? Uh, uh, yeah, you know um, what I'm talking about. Uh, yeah. Very well done. What a man, a jack of all trades with master jack of all trades, like master it's that's not it. right. Yeah. Something like that. Hopefully it's not that. Um, but yes, I mean we, we we are just very we are just very blessed to be doing what we do every day to play on cars. Guys come into that workshop and they say, I would do anything to work here. I would do anything. I'm saying to him, sorry, mate, but it's just us guys, and we are fortunate to, to be doing this. Um, and I love it, absolutely love it. And being able to, sorry, I'm going full circle here, but to be able to sit in something which you welded together, and it's got a steering wheel, and it makes a noise, and you propel forward, it's an incredible feeling. It's fantastic. Exactly, exactly. So, um. And, and, and for the for guys that know that's never been to your shop, it is the cleanest shop I've ever seen in my life. Okay. Yeah, a little bit <laughs> I've seen fanatical. kitchens not as clean as your shop. <laughs> yeah. Um, everything is so everything is so precise. Um, and and like I said, when I looked at it, I, I think that uh, who was it that that was there explained to me your your way of working is what. A, te- a ten mole bolt has to go through eleven hole. Uh, what's an eleven mole hole? Yeah, that, no, everything. Was no. is, oh, is a ten this, mole to be ten mole. This is the problem, and we often talk about it in the workshop. We call it the the, the eight millimeter syndrome. Syn, 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 syndrome? Syn, no, that's not the right word. Um, the eight millimeter scenario. We call it the eight yeah. millimeter scenario. I have to drill an eight mole hole for an eight mole bolt. I refuse to drill at 8.5. I absolutely refuse to. <laughs> and what it causes me, if I drilled at 8.5, I would have probably saved myself half an hour because the 8 mil bolt doesn't go through an 8 mil hole. It's called <laughs> size to size. But I will not get my head past that. I, I have to drill it for the bolt. And if I could get myself a drill bit that's 8.1, it would be fantastic. But anyway, so I'm a so little bit... is out there. Um, if anyone from the uh, uh, Tang Tools, anyone's out there, I'll <laughs> yeah. speak to Vaughn. Please, Please, we need an 8.1 drill. <laughs> 8.1, 10.1, 11.1, all of them. Um, and I have, I just, I don't know where it's come from. I, it's always been with me. I cannot work in chaos. I'm sorry, no, that's not true. I can work in chaos, but I can't work in scattered stuff everywhere. My workshop's got to be tidy. If I drop my sandwich on the floor, I've got to be able to pick it up and continue. I mustn't think, oh, now there's oil all over it. And the guys, they respect me for that. They don't fight me on it. They know that I do go a little bit ballistic when the place is dear my car. I want it neat and tidy. And I think it, it creates a certain mindset. If your mind is uncluttered, you could focus on what you're doing and you can do it well. Um, and and I, that's just the I'm way sure I work. You- you don't lose as many 10 mil sockets as everybody else because you no, always know I where they are. Those, I see those little Facebook posts and I just smile and I think I've never left, lost a 10 mil socket because <laughs> it's about impossible in my workshop. But yeah, I do, I do get a little bit fanatical, I know, and 
if that's I, if that's my if that's my bad trait, then that's my bad trait. Maybe your staff actually have bought like thirty ten mills and they just <laughs> keep them there. <laughs> and if no one can find it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so yeah. So I, I I don't want to keep you too long. I I know it's a late it's a late night, but what I mean it's absolutely phenomenal talking to you. I mean the, your mindset on, on on how the building stuff and what you've achieved from a South African perspective is just insane. Um, I, I saw that initially when I, I saw the first the GT forties with you. I, I saw that when I, I saw the 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 South Beetle. Um, oh, wait, b- b- before we wrap up on, on, on that. So you still selling the chassis, am I right? Are you yeah, still so going to sell them? Yeah, so we sell either complete cars or, I hate the term, kit car, but let's call it component cars. Um, and, and, and the reason why we can sell it in component form is because, you know, some guys like you and me, um, we're excited about having built it ourselves. And with the Beetle, you can go and buy your own Beetle and take the body off, throw the rest of the stuff away. Then we've made quite a comprehensive build video of where you cut the body. And then we supply you this beautiful chassis, the suspension, all the bits, and you can stick it on. So it's not really a kit car as in you go to a scrapyard and go and buy a lot of stuff and mm. weld it together. We really do give it's you the assembly. same fact. Yeah, it's an assembly. Exactly. It's an assembly. It's not even a build process. It's an assembly process. So so we we supply complete cars. Um, I don't know if I mentioned this when I saw you last, but so we sent one to Germany. And Germany is this one of the strictest countries to get it through molligation. I would say the, the week when you had to get it ready to go to Germany. Is that I, when you I popped it? Yeah. Okay. So it had to go through this Euro test, um, which is done the, the, by TÜV, which is the German authority. And needless to say, I was a little bit nervous. <laughs> but so you have to submit it and you have to pay for this test. They don't just do it. You pay a lot of money. And our car sailed through it, and I I literally mean it sailed. From the moment it arrived, my German distributor kept feeding back to me, what's happened today, what's happened today? And I I feel uncomfortable saying this because it's not in my personality, but one of the first things they said is they haven't seen a hand-built car like this before. They have never seen it to this perfection. And... I was a bit taken aback because um, I, I was convinced that a bunch of Germans would find something seriously wrong. <laughs> Instead, they complimented. I don't even think Germans oh, cool. do that. Anyway, so she passed initial. They, have, they first have an initial inspection, which is where they kind of decide: is it on par? Is it even worth putting on the road? They passed immediately. Then, then they then they do an actual structural inspection. She passed immediately. Suspension. She passed. She passed. She passed. Then they put her on a on a track. They track it, not to try and win a race, but they have to feel what does the car do. Yeah. It passed. Then they have all kinds of specifications, um, and I won't bore you of all that. But the last thing was then the molligation for yeah. for exhaust. What comes out the exhaust? And we missed the cutoff with like 0.01 percent or something. <laughs> so we just turned the fuel mixture down a bit and it passed. But what I wanted to say, so so when we build the car in the factory, we have to build it to a very high standard so it can yeah. pass any any criteria. That same package is what we sell to a guy building it in component form. So we know that doesn't matter how unpractical he is, when he assembles it, and as you correctly said, it's just an assembly process. He doesn't need an angle grinder and stuff. That, that's no. He's going to have a nice product, and he's going to be happy with it. But that that makes me happier because the last thing I get very nervous when people build chassis. I yeah. get extremely, extreme, especially when you're talking bigger horsepower and that type of stuff yeah. going yeah. going into it. 
um, especially as someone that's never done it before, and all of yeah. a sudden he's like, oh, it's great, it's great shooting, and <clears throat> make it happen. Yeah. And it's like, and I was, yeah. There's no idea what what actually goes in behind it. They don't understand the structure, the movement, steel movement, and this type of stuff. So what what you're saying now makes me way comfier because you guys have handled that that process. If if I'm not mistaken, how you guys are doing it, that's a big part of how uh, the kit car system works in the U.S. They they also like it because of rules and regulations where there should be no welding involved. Um, yeah. You order the parts, you say you assemble. So you you go buy yourself a nice big toolbox with every socket and everything, yes. and you can build you can build a car. You do not have to use a grinder at yeah. all. Um, everything comes out nicely. You can they prepped, ready for paint basically, um, yeah. and it, and it goes in. Um, I love I love that that concept i'll, I'll stick a, a this a conf, i'll get the, the links and stuff for you we'll stick links up for everyone so they can actually see and get hold of you um and i'll see if i can grab one of your videos on the, what they look like as well yeah there's there's at the moment there are 22 videos um available showing from the first day that i conceived the stupid idea of building a v8 style beetle <laughs> through to what we're doing now but what i also wanted to just quickly mention on that subject is the, the the other big part of a car, of course, is the suspension and the brakes. So mm. with the GD40, we had welded our own wishbones because you can't exactly buy GD40 yeah. wishbones over the shelves. And so a lot of things were fabricated and we designed it and built it to the highest specs. But with the Beetle, we knew that that's a part which a lot of the authorities frown upon is made uprights and made yeah. suspension. So on the Beetle, we use only OEM suspension and OEM brakes. So we use OEM wishbones, OEM calipers, OEM uprights, oh, everything. Wow. So when it arrives at the authority, the guy looks up and says, oh, shit, I know that. And he signs yeah. it off. And, and so the chassis and then the chassis, we get totally carried away. We only use a very high-grade aluminum um, or aluminum, which is used in ship building. So it's a it's aluminum that's designed to cope with torsional movements because, as you know, in a ship, the ship's permanently doing this. So yeah. If the alley's not right, it's going to just crack. So we use a special alley, which costs a bloody fortune, certified by Lloyds of London, can you believe it? Um, and then the only person who welds it, I contract that person in, and he welds for the Air Force all the aluminium aeroplanes. Yes. Um, so he's very highly certified, so he welds it. So we have all our tors torsional strength out of the alley. We have our correct welds, blah, blah, blah. The, the rear cradle, which holds the engine gearbox, most of it is chromoly or domex. So everything, like Mr. Fury always does, is completely over-designed. But I'd much rather be over-designed than kind of okay or not quite there. I, I've got a T-shirt that a mate of mine made. It says Mr. Overdesign on it. Um, <laughs> of course, that's what I do. But I'd rather, much rather do that. Um, and sometimes to my detriment, because it costs me a fortune to do it this way, but that's the way I like it. I know mm. that when I give it to this guy, it's bulletproof. I'm not going to get a call saying, the brakes don't quite work, or it does something funny when I turn left. I don't want those calls. I want to know. You can drive it as hard as you want, but you're not going to break it, and I'm never going to get the ball. Exactly. Yeah. So, so just between the two of us in October, when I get there, yes, I'm, I'm going to see. I'm going to see these these starting the design process of the the three five six. Don't give can me another a distraction. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um. Just just on something. So, um, a while back, I I had a split window combi. In, in the magazine, um, like you say, with one of these with um, uh, Subaru Motors in. Yes. And the, the one day this the owner phones me, um, because we we've had a few discussions. He's like, um, listen, I I just purchased something uh, down the road from me, and I thought I'd let you know. And I'm like, okay. He's like, yes, I I found a Porsche 356. 
It's actually okay. been down the road for me for, for years. Yeah. And it's got 35 Ks on the clock. No. Can't be. And I'm like, that's what I did was I said. So he sent me a photo of the of the speedometer. Um, the car apparently came to South Africa. It was purchased by a doctor or someone who was in love with it, but he never drove it. It went out and around the block and went and He wasn't big on shows or something. He just wanted it. Yeah. Um, when this guy bought the car, the car was apparently three Ks up the road. He sent the truck to go fetch it. It still had the original tires, everything no. from the day no. it came. Yeah, and he's he, if I understand correctly, I think he deregistered it just to make okay. sure because he said he knows if if so. This car is somewhere in South Africa. Um, if because if it came out, he Porsche guys is just gonna hound it. I oh, of course. Can, yeah, yeah. It's one of the most perfect specimens of a three. And he says oh. it is pristine. And he says it's like no oh. one's ever sat in the car. That's awesome. Um, yeah. Th- 35. I'm like, because no, I went 3,500. 3, <laughs> no, 35. And is it is it a right-hand drive? Do you know? I, I, can't, I can't remember. Um, because apparently I, X, X amount was sent over to South Africa as right-hand drive. And there's a story about... Uh, um, a ship that overturned en route here at the Suez Canal or something, and apparently there's some right-hand drives lying there in the mud. Um, oh, wow. I've heard something, I don't know the proper story, but yeah, there were very few right-hand drives into South Africa. Yeah. Mm. That, that, that would be amazing just to see. To see. Go, we need to find out where, where that... I, I know a friend who's a treasure hunter. Maybe we okay. need to, <laughs> to go find <laughs> Give him, a, yeah. give him a lot of money and tell him to go. go we find we don't want we don't want the Kruger millions. Go find us some three five. Yeah, that's all we need. That's all we need. So thank you so much for talking to me. I think this is absolutely phenomenal. Um, it was an honor talking to you. I, I've all, to be honest, I've always wanted to hear your story. Um, <laughs> since I've met you the first time, and I've been what I've. That, you know, you meet someone, you just, I, I just love to know exactly what, what goes on in the in his head and where it all comes from and how the design process happened. You were one of those. So, yeah, Thanks. thank you. Thank you so much. All right. It was great, great chatting to you. And you need to promise me that when you're in Cape Town, you're going to come and drive this this new automobile because oh, you would love I, it. Absolutely. I, love I, am, I am there. Trust me. You, you're not going to keep me away from that one. All right. That would be a brilliant job. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye.